Hello, friends around the world. My name is Brandon Neighbor. Welcome to The Neighborhood, where we have switched on fun discussions with some of the most brilliant, successful, experienced, talented, and highly skilled sales and marketing minds on the planet from the world's fastest growing companies. Enjoy. Hey, everybody. We have Robbie Allen on the show today. Robbie was born and raised in San Francisco and knew from a young age that he wanted to build and scale companies. At Zenefits, which had a $4.5 billion valuation on $584 million capital raised, Robbie took the outbound SDR team from zero to 250 plus reps. And then at Flexport, which had a $3.2 billion valuation and $1.3 billion raised, Robbie built a global outbound team across three continents. After that, Robbie was the head of sales at Mixmax. Mixmax has raised $13 million, and he took that team from a self-serve business to a B2B sales model. Currently, Robbie runs his own consulting practice, Buena Vista Ventures. Buena Vista focuses on emerging technology companies, mainly SaaS businesses, looking to build and scale high-performing and efficient sales organizations. Outside the office, you can find Robbie playing basketball or hiking to the top of a peak. Here we go. Robbie, awesome to have you on the show today. How are you, my man? I'm good. I'm good. good. Thanks for having me, Brian. It's good to be here. Good. Fresh off your recent trip to Europe. You're in a feel-good mood. You've got good energy. I'm loving it. Um, You and I have known each other for a while, and uh, I'm really happy and proud uh, to be chatting with you today. I think there's a lot that the audience can learn from you. Um, What I think we'll do, if it's okay with you, is we'll go into some personal stuff first. Um, Let the audience get to know you a little bit better. Uh, We'll go into... A few different things, like around your your uh, your your basketball career. Um, I want to talk about some of the things that that you've done that you did growing up. Um, get an idea for some of your interests. You know, all the way from Robbie as a kid and what you're interested in and and what you were like, all the way through to uh, to the end of the end of school in Eugene. Um, so, if if you're okay with it, could you give us maybe you know a few minutes on what Robbie was like as a kid and what it was like being Robbie Allen as a as a child growing up? Yeah, sure. Um, and I guess to start, I'm super excited to be here, super excited you're doing this. Uh, and, you know, kind of can't wait to see the first handful of these episodes released to the wild, I think, cool. uh, given your network and people you know, it's gonna be fun. But yeah, a little on me. So I um, born and raised in San Francisco. Uh, um, people tell me that's something unique that live here because so many people uh, kind of scratch and claw and work hard to, to move to San Francisco uh, because, you know, in, in sort of the world of tech, it's considered to be the land of opportunity. I was fortunate in some ways to grow up right in the middle of it. Uh, and I knew at a really young age that I wanted to um, build and scale companies. Like it was just something where when I was five years old, I used to tell my mom that I wanted to put a suit on and go downtown, uh, <laughs> to work. Um, cool. obviously the suit thing has changed. People don't really wear suits anymore in San Francisco unless you work in, I don't know, finance or, or something like that. But, um, from a young age, I've been very interested in this notion of sort of like building, building things from scratch, building, building wealth, building value for markets and, and that sort of a thing. Um, hey, you know, we, growing up, can I, can we pause on that just for a minute? Yeah. Did you ever, did you have any businesses or like ways of making money? Wait, actually, there's a really good question that, uh, someone asked me the other day They want to pay it forward to the audience and get, get your thoughts. What was your, what was your first way of making money? Hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so I used to hustle uh, Pokemon cards. I don't know if you remember what those are. Of course. Um, I, had a, I had a little business at a, a, in elementary school. And for folks that don't know, Pokemon was like a Japanese trading card game uh, that got really popular in Japan and sort of like overtook uh, my generation, I guess. And I went to a Japanese bilingual school in San Francisco called Clarendon. So cool. it was sort of like everybody there was first generation Japanese where their parents immigrated from Japan. And and uh, I happened to grow up kind of right around the corner from there. So I, I went to school there. Um, there was a lot of popularity around that, and, and I saw an opportunity. I think uh, that was one example. I got into I got into sneakers um, when I started to sort of really get into basketball, and so I started to kind of buy and trade uh, sort of like you know um, sneakers that were you know popular, and I would buy them sort of when they were released for a cheaper price and sell them. Cool a little bit more. It didn't, it didn't make a lot of money, but it was something where I kind of was able to, to, to get good at it, uh, so to speak. Um, those were, I guess those were a couple things. And I think that eventually kind of scaled up until I, I landed in the world of sales where uh, I think I really enjoyed that because it was something where I could control my own destiny, so to speak. Quick insert here. What is your favorite sneaker you've ever traded for? Oh man. 
Um, yeah, so I think it's kind of a random one that most people won't know, but it's uh, the story here. It's, it's a pair of Air Flight 89s. And my, my younger brother and our sort of like mutual best friend who grew up around the corner from us in the Haight-Ashbury in San Francisco, uh, we used to, when I was really young, we'd sell lemonade on the corner on hot days in San Francisco. Um, and uh, we would sort of play up the fact that, you know, my mom grew lemons in the backyard, but mostly it was just like the concentrated lemonade that you'd get from Safeway. <laughs> and so we'd sell this. And then I remember like I'm, uh, the listeners won't know this, but I, I, I'm very tall. And so like at a young age, I became like really big and like the whole cute factor of selling lemonade started like drifted away from me. And I was no longer like necessarily like somebody who was like an obvious candidate to sell lemonade. So I, you know, naturally the opportunity still being there, I recruited my younger brother and, and uh, our buddy Ian. And, um, you know, I sort of operated in the background, you know, refilling and sort of getting them out there. And we made enough money one Saturday afternoon, a sunny Saturday afternoon in the fall in San Francisco, where we could all go to a sneaker store on Haight Street and buy a pair of Air Flight 89s. And so I guess you could say that was a trade of like labor and lemonade for, for sneakers. But uh, I'll never forget uh, that pair because all three of us walked out of the Store, out of the store with the uh, with the same shoes. Oh, uh, that's a great story. Two things. One, um, uh, what did you say? It's something in lemonade. Uh, you said labor and lemonade. Labor and lemonade would be the f- title of your first book. Um, <laughs> second of all, everyone of us mere mortals at six foot and under always wonders what it's like to be tall. And uh, people always think of the upside, pun intended, uh, but the, right. some of the downside could be you could retire from lemonade sales very early in your career, which mm-hmm. is, uh, yeah. that is, that can be a sad story, but it's a good story. I for had you. to let that drift away. Yeah. <laughs> you got your 89s, <laughs> you're good. So, um, so let, let's talk about, let's talk about high school for a second. So you went to Ada, St. I's College Prep in San Francisco, is that right? And played basketball? Yeah. St. Yep. St. Ignatius. Uh, that's where I kind of really got into sports and, and um, yeah, played, played basketball and did high jump at, at uh, SI. Cool. What position did you play in basketball? Uh, you know, I was kind of, I, I played power forward. Um, I was pretty new to, I started playing basketball really in high school as a baseball player before that, but an injury kind of prevented me from continuing that path. So, um, okay. I was tall and I could jump and I was pretty quick. So I started to pick up basketball and they, they stuck me at power forward and I didn't really have like a ton of skill per se. I was just sort of like springy and, and, and my batteries were kind of always charged and cool. So I did that um, for for four years, and then I went to college up in uh, up at Oregon, at University of Oregon, mm-hmm. and um, I decided not to kind of follow the basketball path. But after about a year, sort of missed it and missed the organized sports, missed the competition, um, and was was one of those guys in college who you could basically see me at the rec center, you know, seven days a week playing pickup <laughs> basketball. So I actually ended up finding a, a local junior college called Lane Community College, cool. um, and I met the coach, and I, I got to know him, and he gave me a full scholarship, and I ended up going and playing two years of basketball basketball at a little junior college in town. I was still going to, to University of Oregon and I went to the business school and, you know, kind of had, took a full load of credits there. And then unbeknownst to most people I knew, I was also taking the bus on the other side of town and, and taking a, a full load of credits at a community college just to play basketball. And it ended up being this really fun thing because I, you know, community college, uh, most people you and I work with and know didn't spend any time in community college. And right. so this is kind of have a little secret I have. Um, and it ended up being an amazing thing for me. You get to meet, you meet a lot of people that are, you know, decades older than you, and they're just kind of now getting to getting around to, to going to school to maybe get like an associate's degree or something like that, uh, to kind of up level a little bit. And so it was kind of humbling in a sense that I, I really, uh, I guess I really grew t- to appreciate what I had um, at the university that I was going to across town. And, and I got to, I got to get my two years of basketball in at that level. And, and that was kind of all I needed. And went back to U of O and finished up my degree. Awesome, man. Wow. Very cool. I love that you uh, went after your passion uh, with a um, credits at this school, basketball at this school, vengeance, uh, missing your missing your craft. Um, yeah. One more thing. I think you've done some coaching in your day as well uh-huh. uh, while we're on the basketball. So um, when I say the basketball, I mean while you're on your basketball career. Um, yeah. I got used to saying – the basketball or the football or the baseball when I was in Australia. So sometimes I put the in front of a, a sport arbitrarily. Anyways, while we're on your basketball career, so let's talk about some of the coaching you did as well. What 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 does your coaching career consist of? Yeah. So um, after after kind of hanging it up, so to speak, uh, from a couple of years playing in college, I um, one of my assistant coaches from from my college team uh, actually took a took an off-season job as the head coach of a local high school team uh, for Mohawk High. Um, it's about 45 minutes outside of Eugene, Oregon. And to give you an idea, I mean, this, this high school probably had 200 students. And at the 
you know, at the, um, and I, I come from a, from a school where there were probably 65 kids who tried out for the varsity or for the, you know, the, the basketball team every right. year and only right. about 10 or so made it. It was a big thing. Seven kids showed up to the tryouts. Uh, awesome. So all seven kids made it. Um, <laughs> and this is ranging, ranging from kids who had played basketball to had never played in their life. And so this was like a very different kind of challenge. Um, but we, I think the team had finished in last place out of 10 people for like the last, uh, 10 or so years. And, and so myself and I recruited another buddy who played on the team with me to come play or to come assistant coach the team and and it was it was more than a challenge because like you know what we did not have any sort of real semblance of talent on this team but you got to know this group of kids and um we would take a yellow school bus you know two hours north and south of eugene twice a week to go play games and in some of these towns that you know i, I probably never would have otherwise set foot in in my life and i, I actually remember uh at halftime um, there was a game and I can't even remember the name of the city. It was a Western Oregon town. Uh, there was a, a hoedown at halftime where about 30 people came out in cowboy boots and sort of did like a cowboy hoedown and they had a live auction, um, or so they had a live raffle. And so they, they drew a raffle prize. Um, you know, there's like dust and hay now all over the court. These kids have to come out and play the second half still. And they, they draw a number and someone in the crowd wins and they're going crazy and we don't know what the prize is. And they walk out like a, like a 1500 pound, like pig basically from the, <laughs> from the locker room and they auctioned off like a full grown male pig and somebody took up a pig uh, just to give you an idea of kind of the uh you know the 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 uh, spirit of some of these games um but that was that was a learning experience for sure but uh the end of the story is we ended up finishing in second place and and wow. in the league which was the best they'd ever done and and you know while it wasn't necessarily the uh, the team i i would have sort of picked or recruited myself because you know frankly we had to we had to take a week to get there wasn't enough interest in the school i started to really figure out that the coaching was something i was passionate about and that was um cool. that was a takeaway i brought with me and, and still to this day you know it, it's kind of like a guiding thing for me in terms of looking for opportunities to coach uh because even when you're making a small difference you know in, in, in a group of kids that are never going to play basketball at a high level um you can still have an impact on their life in a positive way um so that was a fun experience cool man we are gonna we are gonna cover that in a little bit a little bit more on coaching from a professional context that's a great story um okay cool so that that brings us to to post eugene um you get out of the sphere of ducks in, in Eugene, and uh, your first role after school is what? Yeah, so I, I um, I'm actually at the time working for a craft beer company um, that was based in Eugene, a company called Ninkasi Brewing Company. They uh, the CEO was a former Wall Street guy who came back to Eugene and built this really really successful fast growing craft beer company and. And uh, I was able to finagle a job at that company, which, as you can imagine, was a really fun job to have yeah. in college. And it made me very popular, especially <laughs> during the summertime. Um, and I, a part of me thought I wanted to pursue that post-college. But the more I kind of dug into it, I, it just wasn't – it was more of something that I – I liked the idea of building you know, this business, but it wasn't necessarily the industry I wanted to work in. So I had some people that I was close with give me the advice that um, you know, starting a career in sales would be um, you know, like a good place to start. And, and I, I ended up taking a job at this company called People Matter, um, which was a, like an HR technology company. Mm -hmm. um, and frankly, like didn't really know a lot about the business, didn't really have a great why for why I picked it other than it was like the first door and it was an opportunity that opened up to me. Um, the role was just a straight up outbound SDR role, the first outbound SDR the company had ever hired, mm -hmm. um, reporting directly to the VP of sales, uh, you know, little to no training kind of threw you out into the wild. And, and I flailed a little bit for, you know, for probably about a month until really starting to get the hang of it. And I think the thing that I liked about it was the challenge of being able to sort of like basically directly challenge and, and sort of try to add value to people that were, you know, often 20 years, my senior, um, and, and help, help kind of, um, book meetings and that sort of thing. And, and I did really well at it, um, kind of against all odds. It wasn't something where I was necessarily set up for a ton of success. And that was something that I, I kind of remembered, uh, and brought with me in future roles where I was the one responsible for hiring and training folks in that role. And, and then I was for a while. Um, and that office was a satellite office for a company based in South Carolina. And I remember I was on a camping trip with my wife, a uh, girlfriend at the time. And I came back and I turned my phone on and, and somebody I had 15 voice messages and all my colleagues told me, Hey, they shut the office down. I was like, Oh my God. Um, so they, they closed the, they closed the office down. It was, you know, it was something that I, I, I think I just didn't have enough, um, uh, sort of business aptitude or savvy to, to see something like that coming per se. I was just sort of focused on my own success, but it ended up being a blessing in disguise. Um, I got introduced at a company called Zenefits where mm -hmm. a friend of mine worked. I had been a successful AE for, you know, nine months and <laughs> like any successful AE of nine months was convinced I should be an AE, but decided to take a step back and take a step forward. So I actually came in as an SDR at Zenefits and, yep. and I was an early employee there. Uh, and it was an amazing act. 
atmosphere. I mean, we were, it was the kind of place where, um, you know, the phones were ringing all day and, and we just, there weren't enough salespeople to take the number of demos that we were setting and the deals we were closing. And, and so I came in there and, and it was kind of the start of a really, really interesting journey. And I, I went from sort of the top performing rep to, to becoming a manager, uh, and building out this outbound team. They were sort of an all inbound shop before that. I built out a team of about 20 SDRs in San Francisco, mm-hmm. uh, hired a manager and, and, and placed them there. And, and the CEO, Parker, uh, approached me and asked me, um, you know, hey, do you want to move out to Arizona and build this, you know, at sort of 10x the scale? And I remember telling him no at first. I was like, I'm a San Francisco kid. My girlfriend's here. My mom, like my, all my friends and family are here. <laughs> and I remember I remember he told me this thing that always stuck with me. He said, um, you know, Robbie, once or twice in your career, if you're lucky, a big, you know, maverick tidal wave will come up behind you. And it's kind of your decision if you want to grab a surfboard and, and jump in and, and try to ride it or not. Um, and when a CEO tells you something like that, it's, it's kind of hard not to, uh, <laughs> not to get fired up. Yeah, exactly. So, it's a, it's a so about two weeks later, yeah. yeah, about two weeks later, I was on a flight to Phoenix uh, <laughs> and I was moving out there and, um, you know, over the course of the next two and a half years, I, I built, and this is always, it, it's kind of wild to say out loud, but I built and scaled out an SDR team of about 250. Um, so we were hiring, you know, 30 SDRs every month and, and really going from, uh, you know, um, product market fit to repeatability, to full-on hyper-growth uh, in this really condensed time period. And there were a ton of learnings, and I'm sure some things that we'll be able to unpack um, along that journey. And it was, a, you know, it was a big growth experience for me. I was 25 years old you know, in a room full of you know, 200 people that I'd hired and this whole organization we'd built out. Um, and so learning just how to, how to, um, how to grow um, you know, with this growing business personally um, and ha- how to sort of up-level my skills and, and understand sort of like what the things were that, that I could do to add value um, at the certain different stages we went through it was was an amazing experience. Um, oh, and uh, cool. yeah, and so we went on a journey from about zero to 70 million in ARR over those three years, which uh, which was which was a lot and, and an amazing journey. And and when that journey kind of concluded, I, I had sort of done everything I set out to do at, at Zenefits and, and wanted to move back to the Bay Area. Uh, and so I, I came back to SF and actually got introduced to a company called Flexport. Robbie, let's pause for a second because I want to keep your headspace in the Zenefits zone for a minute because we'll hop into sure. Flexport in a little bit. For those that are listening, you heard the amount of scale, both from a hiring, bookings, and revenue perspective, and just an operational scale. It's unbelievable somewhat unheard of hyper growth scale that you guys are operating at. First of all, let's talk about hiring teams. So when you think about recruiting at massive scale, what are a couple of the fundamentals that people need to keep in mind and remember or get right um, that you think about as a framework for how you scaled that much growth for hiring? Yeah. Um, a great question. And I think, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, I can probably speak a little bit more intelligently to it than I could at the time. So I think the first thing that's, that's just so important that you hear time and time again, but I think that just there is sort of no amount of time that you can spend uh, uh, that is too much is getting your foundational team, your founding team, your sort of first team right. Um, and, you know, in, the, in my case, I had the benefit of building out a team in San Francisco and was able to sort of um, get a couple, two of the top reps, my friends, Alex Natch and, and Andrew Case, uh, both of whom became very close friends and were at my wedding uh, and, and to this day are still very close friends, were, were sort of the top reps in San Francisco and, and, and were, were able to get them to move about the Arizona with me. And so having that institutional knowledge just like there on the ground made such a big difference because there's already this like dynamic of what excellence looks like for every new hire that comes in. Yep. Um, and I think that that's really important. And I, I think that for folks that are, that are starting a new role or coming into a new environment, um, if you're in a sales leadership position, whether you're an SDR manager or a VP of sales or a VP of marketing or whatever the case may be, um, you should probably already know who the first two or three people that you're going to recruit and hire into the organization are going to be. Um, and the reason for that is because like, you, you can create an environment that you've got a little bit more control over and create a culture that you're uh, comfortable with and familiar with and that you can help sort of integrate your, your new people into. Because once you start to add new folks, onto the team if you don't already have that like foundational culture in place um you can't you can't go back in time and rebuild it um and that's that can be sort of like a recipe for for disaster and so i was very fortunate to um to have benefited from that without necessarily prioritizing it but it's something that i've learned now over the years that you uh you can't really spend enough enough time in the beginning recruiting and focusing on like who's going to be my like founding go-to-market team yep Yep, that makes sense. Then then we need to get into into the actual operations of hiring that many people. Can you give us an understanding of what are some of the best practices from a recruitment perspective that you need to nail when you're hiring at scale? Mm -hmm, mm Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. So I think um, it's a great question. And we went through many iterations of this. We went through sort of me being the sole owner of uh, sort of top top to bottom recruiting for for this organization to having a, an internal recruiting team of 15 recruiters that were sort of you know running an engine. And so I saw kind of every evolution along the way. And I, I think there were a couple of takeaways that I um, that I recommend to folks when I talk to them. And so the first one is like, like when you think about your role as a leader, like at the end of the day, it's your call. And, and it's sort of like the success uh, or failure of the of the sort of decisions that you make when you hire people rest on your shoulders. And so when you think about like what is the highest point of leverage that you have uh, throughout the entire recruiting process, um, in my opinion, it's kind of two things. One, it's like setting the tone in terms of look for and what our criteria are and making that very evident so that everybody who's involved with the recruiting process is aligned on the same page, right? So sort of defining the role, but also sort of making sure that you like walk the walk in terms of like the team that you're building along the way. So it's uh, it's sort of self-represented. And the second thing is like when you think about the leverage that you have as a, as a, as a, you know, as a leader or a hiring manager, it's actually like, you know, the sort of final stage interviews and the decision of like go, no go and the ability to close candidates and, and then sort of everything that happens after that in terms of the successful ramp and management of the team. Um, and so the, the thing that I suggest to most folks is like, please negotiate with your CEO or the leader or the person you're recruiting to, um, whether you've got internal recruiting resources or uh, outsourced external resources, like you need the support in terms of like prospecting and management. Like we've proven in so many different aspects of the business and we can take sales as an example that like um, specializing the sales process in terms of appointment setters and like exactly. deal closers exactly. is just like more effective. And from a recruiting standpoint, um, you should think about it in a similar way. And so there's just going to be, it's, it's nice for all of us to think that like we can take a sniper approach to recruiting and just like pick the four people we want to hire, hyper focus on them and close three out of four of them. But the reality of the situation is it's like never been more competitive to recruit really in any market. Um, and that it's, it's, uh, you know, it's sort of a candidate's market, so to speak. And so you want to get recruiters working for for you. Uh, and, and, it, and it is worth the cost of admission. Uh, and it's just something to think about when you're either taking a new role or managing up that you really want to help define the amount of work that that sort of like recruiter is going to going to do for, for you. And so in the beginning, it benefits. We had we had a couple of SF based recruiting firms um, doing a lot of this recruiting for us in Arizona. And I would take flights out there twice a week and hold full on interview days where uh, we would do, you know, upwards of 10, 15 interviews and do kind of batch hiring. Um, but it allowed me to really isolate and focus on uh, being super present in the interview uh, and making my like, conscious decisions to kind of, you know, place the right bets on, on these people that we were hiring. Um, and that combined with the support of the folks that I mentioned earlier, who were kind of um, already high performers being involved with the process allowed us to get a lot of those early hires right uh and that helped us um along the journey awesome man that's great um two more things i want to talk about uh with benefits and then we'll move on as you're evaluating talent at that scale so some people some people that are listening are gonna need to hire five people in a year some people that are listening are gonna need to hire 500 people in a year or maybe even 5,000 people in a year depending on um the, the 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 level of responsibility that they have what's the calibration method that you found uh, that is most useful or valuable as you're going through that level of, of, of hiring at scale? Yeah, it's a good question because I think the the thing that worked well for us in the beginning was not necessarily the thing that worked well for us sort of halfway along the journey. And that, tra- that transition wasn't super smooth. And so I, I was sort of the single point of accountability or single point of failure or success, however you kind of want to state that, and mm-hmm. that I made the hiring decision for the first hundred or so sales reps that we hired where I was in every single interview. And so as you can imagine, this absorbed like a ton of my bandwidth, but we were fortunate to have a lot of support in terms of like ramping and making reps successful and and then hitting their numbers and were able to stay ahead of that. So I was able to do that. Um, Handing off that sort of decision responsibility took quite a bit of calibration. And I think that, I think that um, at the end of the day with recruiting, like it's nice to, I think it's nice for organizations to have, um, a fully calibrated, well-oiled recruiting machine where uh, you can kind of predictably make the same decisions about hires based on like an agreed upon set of criteria and principles. And and I think that there's companies out there that, that do this really well. It's really hard to do during like a hyper growth phase. And I, I actually recommend uh, to most folks that you, you hold on to sort of like a single point of accountability or a single decision on terms of these hire, this hiring um, kind of as long as you can. Yep. Um, and, and then as you get folks up to speed and you're able to sort of delegate out some of the, some of the hiring responsibilities, like do that. But I think it, I think it is really the single most important thing that you can do um, when you're at like a hyper growth stage and narrowing that 
level of sort of responsibility for a decision down to like the smallest group of stakeholders possible. Um, it may sound counterintuitive because uh, a lot of bigger companies do this well where it's delegated across you know many people. But in my opinion, I, I think it's better to hold on to it. Um, and when you get to a point where you've got folks that are, cause when you keep in mind, like we're hiring 30 new people to start on the first Monday of every month, but like, you know, by the time we've got a hundred people on board, like the most ramped, uh, folks that we have on the team have been there for four months. Now this is like a, an experience and scale that like most businesses like won't necessarily, um, have to deal with. But I think to some degree, um, many hiring managers have been in a position where the uh, next most uh, tenured individual just doesn't have like a ton of tenure. Um, so you have to work with those folks and help them become owners and help them really understand that like as an owner of the business, like these are the specific things that we look for. And here's how you embody those certain principles. And those are things you need to work on. But uh, for me, it, it, would, it actually was holding on to, uh, to that as like one of the singular most important points of my job uh, kind of as long as I could. Yep. Yep. Solid. I like it. Um, the next one is on um, on onboarding. So uh, this is something that most people overlook and turn into a checkbox exercise. What did you do to make sure they were set up for success in the onboarding phase and anything after that? Anything you would include in, in that phase to make sure they were set up for success at massive scale as you're bringing a lot of people on board in the sales function? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so a couple things. We... we, we um, we had an owner of the onboarding program um, from day one. So awesome. one of the things that we did was we hired somebody into a sales enablement capacity as one of like the very first hires that we made. And they ran a two-week boot camp where we put folks through everything from systems training to market training to kind of competitor intel to, you know, pitching to live role plays. Uh, and we actually would have folks get like certain certificates. And this is something that we took really seriously um, because like kind of two reasons. One, it allowed us to create like a system of measurement where we can say, okay, if we are able to deliver like X amount of training, like what sort of output can we measure with Y, like, you know, months, months down the line, weeks yep. down the line. Yep. Um, and that was, that, that gave us actually a feedback loop that tied back into our recruiting conversations where we were actually, ta actually talking about ramp success of people that we had recruited three months prior in recruiting meetings. Um, and I think it's important that you've got that feedback loop of like success on hires all the way back to recruiters that isn't just like anecdotal, but it's actually like looking at the data of performance based on uh, based on how these folks got ramped. So one thing was like just, yeah, creating an owner early on with sales enablement was critical. Yep. Um, uh, systematizing it and having a way to kind of measure rep performance week over week and having having benchmarks and and then really sticking to those, making it clear that if, if new hires didn't hit certain criteria along this journey, you know, in their first three months, there wasn't going to be a grace period. I mean, it, it really was, you needed to perform form at a certain level, even in the early days. And so that, that wasn't so much putting numbers on the board in the first month as it was showing, you know, competence and, and sort of learning and, and, and demonstration of ability to be coached and some of the things that we looked for. Yep. Um, and so those were, yeah, those are a couple of things. And, and to be frank, like that onboarding program, we needed to tear it down and rebuild it every 90 days because, right. um, you know, what we were measuring and what we were coaching on needed to be updated based on sort of how the business had evolved because it was such a condensed time period during hyper growth uh, that you really have to constantly be looking at it through the lens of like, is the foundation correct? And do we need to rebuild it? And, and it turned out we need to rebuild it every 90 days. And so it was a lot of work, but, um, you know, it, it created a lot more relief for the managers of those people and, and for the people themselves, you know, once they were able to pick up their bag, so to speak, and know that they had the skills um, to succeed. Cool. Um, uh, one more, one more side question on that. Is there a, like, is there like three things that you can say every person that is onboarding new sales development, sales talent, people within the sales and marketing org, or just generally onboarding? Is, is there a few things, maybe three things that you'd say that you have to put into or get right within your onboarding program or project? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So I think the first thing is that like everybody needs a crystal clear understanding of like what their role is and, and sort of like what the, um, what the value is that they're adding to the business. Mm -hmm. And hopefully this is something you did in the recruiting process. And it sounds kind of obvious, but, um, but helping people like understand like why, what it is that they're doing is so critical to the overall success of the company and the vision of the company creates a lot of buy-in early on. And, and for, for a lot of people, it's one of the reasons why they consider and decide to take a job in the first place is what's the impact that I can have? How is this going to help you know, me grow personally, but also this business grow? Um, and, and helping kind of create that reminder is, I think, really important. 
um, helping people feel um, like this, they're helping people understand like how, how they can fail and that failure is appropriate, I think is really important too. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think you have to define what that failure means, but people need to feel safe to safe to fail. And by, by fail, I don't necessarily mean like fail to show up to work. <laughs> what I mean is like fail, um, fail in like an effort to, to do the right thing, right? So maybe you're, uh, maybe you decide to call the CEO of a company that you're prospecting into and you, you get a connect and maybe your pitch wasn't quite as sharp as you wanted it to be. Um, but at the end of the day, like you, you were doing the right thing. You were calling up in the organization. Like that's something that you want to celebrate and help people understand that like, that's actually something like you're doing the right thing here. Now let's talk about how we can like perform better, you know, in that specific scenario. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so creating that kind of an environment I think is, is really important too. And then I think the third thing is you have to create a rigorous uh, system of measurement. So it's like what a lot of sales leaders do is they'll pair up a new hire with the top rep on the team, tell them to sit in on demos uh, and take notes, right, for as long as they need. Mm -hmm. And then after about four weeks, let's start like funneling demos to that new AE. Or if it's an SDR, let's start start funneling leads to that SDR. Um, And then it sort of just becomes this sink or swim type of an environment. And you see this perpetuated, I think, at a lot of sales orgs. And and it's understandable. I think that like most of most sales leaders are great at what they do because they're looking at the bottom line results, not necessarily like the top line inputs of pipeline or new, new talent. Um, but if you don't, if you're not really rigorous about like, these are the specific things that you need to do to be successful, um, you you kind of like institute this feeling in a rep that like, there isn't necessarily a repeatable playbook for success. And it's actually their responsibility to create sort of like a path to success. And so what ends up happening is every rep does something different. Mm -hmm. And when every rep's doing something different, you can't scale. And so you never cross that chasm from product market fit to repeatability to hyper growth. Um, and so once you've actually got folks doing things repeatably, now you can really like press the gas uh, and, and sort of make things happen a lot faster because you've at least got the knowledge that everybody is um, sort of executing and selling in a similar, uh, you know, in a similar fashion. But you can't do that unless that folks are getting ramped up the same way. Nice. Awesome, man. Great advice, Robbie. Um, and then last question on Zenefits and we'll and move on. The machine that you put together from a sales development perspective, from the outside looking in, just unbelievable uh, for all the different moving parts you had to piece together and the best practices that, that you guys deployed while you were doing that. So someone that's building a sales development function, either they're a sales leader and they're building sales development function. And a lot of people think that translates well, but oftentimes it doesn't or a founder or someone that's never done this or never been in sales before, or someone that's the head of marketing, oftentimes they'll have to build sales development engine to try to you know, kick off and catalyze their first phases of, of growth and then high growth and then hyper growth. So what is your mindset when you're building a sales development engine? Let's start there. Yeah. Well, I think when I'm, when we think about a sales development engine, typically like you're typically building this because you don't have a marketing engine that's pumping out leads, right? Like you're, you're, you aren't necessarily building this engine as like a, uh, a first investment in the business in a lot of cases. Like typically you've already got some salespeople in the org and they're closing some deals and like you want to scale that function up. But when you look at some of the other inputs into like where the demand is being created, you don't necessarily have like the level of confidence in, in what those inputs are to scale that. So you think about, okay, let's take this matter to our own hands. Right. Um, and so I think you have to have a hypothesis about, okay, if we're going to make this investment, like there's kind of two things that we need to get right. And the first thing is like the economics need to make sense, meaning like we're going to need to know pretty specifically what kinds of deals and customers we're going after here, what the what the sort of win rates and conversion rates are going to be um, so that we can understand if we hire one SDR, sort of how many AEs this is going to support and ultimately how we can make the economics of the model work. Yep. So the first thing is just like having a hypothesis about, and, and often for companies, if you're going outbound, that's going to be, you know, a slightly more upmarket targeted customer, uh, you know, a named account that, that you sort of understand to be in your, in your demographic of, 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 of product market fit. Um, that's, that's, but it's pretty typical, but it, it can depend. Um, and then I think the second thing is like we're we're investing in building a talent funnel for for the for the business, and uh, this looks different at, at every company. You know, if you're at a very technical enterprise sale, it can be really challenging to you know have a you know twenty year veteran AE and then you know a, a one year out of college SDR, and how are you going to bridge that gap and promote mm-hmm. that person? And in some cases, you can't. So I think for the folks that are um, thinking about their own career paths, definitely look for the type of company where you can kind of uh, get promoted and elevate into 
full cycle roles and see kind of growth there as well, um, where it's not such a big uh, bridge to jump. But in any case, the business needs to think about what are we going to do from like a talent perspective. And, and the best companies uh, develop this talent pool and, and end up recruiting directly out of their SDR organization. And and so for like a much kind of lower cost and much faster ramp time and, and typically much more successful rep, they're able to scale up the, SA, the AE part of the business too. Um, so I think about the economics of, you know, of the uh, of the role itself and then sort of the payoff being not just the output of the role, but but sort of like the uh, multi-year promotion path that you're seeing for folks that you're hiring into that role. Awesome. OK, cool. So let's walk let's walk into Flexport now. So you get to yeah. the, you get to a place where um, you're ready to make a move. Why yeah. Flexport? And tell us about that jump in a minute or so. Yeah. And then we can talk about your experience there and, and let us know what you did. Yeah, so my my former my boss and former my former boss and VP of sales at Zenefit, Sam Blonde, uh, who's now the chief sales officer over at Brex, uh, he was consulting actually at the time for uh, Flexport um, and was helping out specifically with their SDR team. And so he introduced me to Ryan, who's the CEO of Flexport, and I had the chance to meet Ryan and some of the other folks on the team. And um, and basically, you know, Flexport was is this interesting business where it's you know it's a SaaS business in the sense that they're building a software as a service product, but really it's, it's a freight forwarding business. And I personally had not spent any time uh, in the logistics or freight forwarding industry. So <laughs> it was, it was a, it was a new thing. I mean, I, I remember taking some, some supply chain classes that were required in, uh, in college and I was you know practically asleep the whole time. I didn't really understand contextually why it mattered, but Flexport really helped bring that into perspective. And, and maybe we can talk about that later, but yep. um, they basically, they're what they're, the business itself, uh, freight, freight forwarding and logistics is a, um, it's this interesting supply demand business where um, there isn't necessarily a lot of inbound demand kind of regardless of like where you are in the market. Um, essentially, importers, people who make physical products overseas need to, uh, you know, need to basically employ third party freight forwarders like Flexport to help them move those goods wherever they need to go in the supply chain. Um, but they're not necessarily like signing up for demos on websites the way that you would like, you know, Marketo or Salesforce or something like that. So they, they needed to have like an outbound strategy for new logos. Um, and at the time, it was a little bit willy nilly. There were a handful of SDRs in San Francisco. They were doing a good job, but it wasn't really set up to scale. And so I got introduced and, and it was a cool opportunity for me, one, because it was a completely different industry and a new sort of like mental challenge that I was just interested in. Yep. But when I looked at the business, like I saw a couple of things. One, uh, it was growing uh, really quickly, uh, sort of in spite of having basically no sort of predictable like demand generation model. So that told me that like, despite the fact that there's a gap here, uh, the business is growing exponentially. Yeah. And that was really exciting to me. Um, and two, there was there was a unique opportunity um, for for me to learn, uh, where I was going to get a chance to scale out a global team. So we needed to hire SDRs in uh, New York City and LA and Amsterdam and Hong Kong and San Francisco and a few other markets. And so that was that was a unique opportunity where I, I had only really operated in the U.S. before. Um, so I came on board uh, shortly after uh, leaving Arizona and coming back to SF, and and sort of took a role there as the head of global SDR. Very cool. So I have three things I want to talk about within your Flexport experience. Um, firstly, this is um, everyone has this moment if they're go going to look after global teams and businesses that have either global scale, or global ambition. Everyone has this moment where they move to a geographical diversification of focus and resources away from um, just a single market or a single region within a market. This is the first time. Um, at least at scale, uh, that you had had to to do that um, across different countries, where you're diversifying both talent focus, resources that you're spending as well as using, and just your time management and decision making focus across multiple yeah. markets. Um, what are some of the things that you learned uh, that someone needs to think about as they're diversifying across multiple markets? Yeah, um, so it's a great question, and there's a couple things that I learned. Um, kind of after the fact that, that I think I almost wished I'd known at the time. But right. um, the big question that we wrestled with a Zenefit, or sorry, at a Flexport uh, in regards to building this SDR team was to centralize it or to decentralize it. And so at the time when I joined, we were centralized, meaning we were booking and setting demos for all of our global offices in one office in San Francisco. So we were calling out into all these different geos. And the thinking was that because it was centralized, like we would be, there, there was sort of a central knowledge hub. We could help ramp reps faster. We could institute best practices. We could roll out change faster. We could just generally move faster. And so to, to, to remind, like at Zenefits, we were a centralized model, right, where we had this giant office in uh, Scottsdale area. Um, but what we figured out was that these global markets were really different. Um, 
Outbound in Amsterdam looks very, very little like it does in San Francisco or New York City. Right. Um, it's just it's a completely different game and, and, and similar to Hong Kong, which is, you know, worlds away in terms of uh, being able to prospect into accounts. And so we needed actually to we ended up deciding to decentralize it, which was the right decision, because nice. most of the subject matter expertise for that local market lived in that local market. And so you had like a GM and you had some senior salespeople in that local market who could partner up with an SDR to help target the right types of accounts. And so I think for me, that was actually a big exercise in just letting go um, yep. and not being the one to sort of control all the campaigns that we were running and all of the different messaging we were using. And the advice yeah. that I got from a senior executive at Flexport at the time was, uh, encouraging me to think about the function as, as a service to the global GMs that we were working with, um, as sort of like a service provider. And, and as a salesperson, you're not, you don't typically think of yourself as a service provider. Right. Um, but, but basically what they were telling me was that to, to really focus on like listening to what the unique problems were in each of these markets and provide expertise and consultation on how to solve them. But ultimately give that local GM sort of the credence and responsibility to, to make that decision. And honestly, it was kind of hard for me. I, I came from a place where I was successful because I was the one who was controlling and making decisions for, you know, this big organization at Zenefits. And so Flexport was a challenge for me just in the sense that um, success meant sort of like letting go and, and bringing sort of subject matter expertise to the table and making recommendations and asking, you know, offering it more as a consultant, um, but ultimately leaving those decisions to the local GMs. And so um, I guess to come back to your question about how I'd recommend, you know, folks who have uh, you know, global geos that they're selling into. I think you should treat each one like its own unique problem set and, and hopefully get, you know, an expert in there to be the owner of that problem set sooner rather than later and then just provide support. Very cool. Um, the second thing I want to talk about with, uh, with Flexports, sorry, Flexport is um, comp plans. So mm -hmm. when you were at Flexport as well as at Zenefits, and you can, you can talk about Mixmax too if you want to, but don't move on to that too quickly. But from a comp pr plans perspective, um, what did you learn about putting together comp plans and what are the landmines that people should try to avoid as they're putting together comp plans for sales and sales development reps? Hmm. Yeah. Um, so the first thing I did at Flexport was I moved it from a quarterly payout to a monthly payout. Um, and the reason that I kind of lobbied for this and frankly spent like a little bit of, um, I guess kind of personal capital on it, uh, was that we, Inside sales reps need quick feedback loops. And the quickest feedback loop is the direct deposit into your bank account based on the prior month's performance. <laughs> and because it was taking, you know, 120 days to get that feedback loop, like, like reps weren't necessarily feeling the way that they were performing and the way that you really want folks to feel based on like, you know, these incentives. Sure. Uh, and so we moved it to a monthly program and, and kind of overnight, like you, you would sort of see uh, the folks that were performing the highest, like, uh, you know, behaving a certain way and folks that, that sort of weren't behaving a different way. And that's not to say that folks were coming in and being like gaudy about whatever their, their, uh, OTEs were, but it's more just to say that like, you noticed a difference in terms of what the first of the month and the last day of the month and everything in between looked like when there were monthly feedback loops. Yep. So I'm a big fan of like, of, of feedback loops early and often. And when you can program one of the most important feedback loops in sales, which is incentives and, and you know, cash comp plans, uh, you want to have that happen pretty frequently. Um, and I think especially for SDR roles, if, if anybody listening to this is doing a quarterly payout or in, hopefully not anything longer than that, I would, I would consider um, what the operational burden would be to maybe move that to, to a monthly payout. Um, and if it's not too high, I would do it. Uh, and the reason why is just because reps benefit from that feedback, um, especially hyper in a hyper growth uh, environment. Right. Um, so that's that's kind of the first thing that we did. Um, and the next thing that we did was we um, we moved the goals up, uh, and that's always always a hard thing to do. But the team was performing well, and so we moved the goals up. And um, you know the the OTE stays the same, and and I think that that's always a, a challenging thing for a young manager to do in their career is, is help people get on board doing more work for kind of the same pay, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But um, if we were fortunate to have some really kind of talented people on the team that just owned it and went out and, and crushed their numbers and set the bar really high. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of specific things I can talk about with regards to comp plans, but I'm kind of always the belief of, of the system of like rapid feedback loops. Um, uncapped upside, um, as long as it's not going to put the business at risk in any way. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and yeah, those are kind of the two things that I always try to make sure are built into comp plans. Awesome, man. That's great. Great answer. And then um, last thing, um, and this is more general because I know that you and I have had enough conversations um, where I, I believe that one of your superpowers is your 
your strategization, that's a word, for how you navigate your career and subsequent accurate execution. Uh, but what I've, what I've always been impressed by is your ability to identify and understand very, very quickly, digest, ingest, and sorry, ingest, digest, and then, and then, and then execute based on what you've learned um, from a career development and a career navigation perspective. Like it's it's fascinating to have conversations with you, especially over time. So when you're thinking about um, career development, career navigation, um, but in your in your mind, tell us about your mindset for how people should be thinking about the next opportunities that they take because you've had hundreds mm-hmm. and hundreds of these types of discussions and what mm-hmm. actually matters. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good question. So the framework that I've used that has worked well for me um, is I think there's really two things that actually matter when you think about and you evaluate an opportunity in your career. And um, this is what I tell people who are interviewing or how I use, how I use this framework myself. Um, and I think the first thing is the name on the front of the jersey. Um, and so hmm. at the end of the day, um, in the beginning of your career, it's easy to get caught up in like sort of minute details about specific roles that you're in, titles and sort of like small variances in compensation and things like that, um, that at the time feel really important and, and certainly to some degree are important. You know, titles matter, comp matters. Um, but five to 10 years after you maybe move on from that role or, or doing something different in your career, um, what people are going to look back on is like, what was the story of that company and what, what part of that journey did you participate in and sort of what was your role in the journey? And so I think when I when you think about uh, the opportunities that you're evaluating, um, the name on the front of the jersey is going to matter a lot more when it's all said and done. Um, and people associating your name with the type of like you know companies that are that really matter and that are are sort of like lasting and and um, and and go through journeys are the ones that are going to grow your career actually quite a bit more than titles and compensation early on. And the next thing is the people you work with. Um, and this is this is a tough thing to evaluate, but when you're going through the interview process. It's really important to do a thorough evaluation of the folks that you're going to work with, your boss, your boss's boss, your peers, if you're coming into a leadership role, the folks that are going to be reporting directly to you um, and anybody sort of like around your peripheral. And the reason being is like you're going to spend more time with these people than you are your family. Um, You're going to be in there uh, grinding out, working with these folks hip to hip, going on a journey. And um, what you figure out after you go on a journey and then start a new journey and look back is that all of these people that you work with go on to do more journeys. And um, the network that you build internally, the people that you work with um, can create so many opportunities for you in the future um, uh, or not, depending on sort of like the quality of talent of people you work with. So I ask, I just recommend that people are really thoughtful about choosing the type of people they want to sign up to work with. Um, and it can be hard in interview process to really get like a thorough understanding, but you've got internet, you know, resources at your disposal. Use LinkedIn, understand like, are people, um, are people, are the, are the people that you're working with like active online and the type of people that are like investing in their own careers? Um, because that's going to pay off later. And I can't tell you how many, how many deals uh, in my career that have gone a lot smoother because I have an internal contact of somebody that I used to work with at Zenefits or at Flexport. Um, we were able to open the door and get directly to a decision maker and get to a decision a lot quicker. And that's one example of hundreds. But um, the people that you work with and, and the name on the front of the jersey are uh, are really the two things I think at the end of the day that actually matter. I love it. I love it. And um, you mentioning that your your network is your net worth uh, is something that, uh, yeah. that that I think um, people remember and take away. That's awesome. So um, let's ho- let's hop into uh, let, let let's let's hop into uh, mix max. So you're a flexport. You're making the move to mix max. Let's talk about that for a minute. Yeah, sure. So um, my my journey at Flexport um, was was going really well, and I ended up actually getting an introduction to an early stage founder um, at Mixmax. And Mixmax was actually a tool that we were using at the time, and something I was really passionate about uh, because it was like a, a sales productivity tool that um, some of the teams were using internally at Flexport that I thought showed a lot of promise and was really interesting. And they were looking for uh, a head of sales. And so we, we had a dialogue going and the opportunity presented itself for me to kind of jump in and own the, the full um, sales process end to end and get to build a team out from scratch. And this was a business that had gone from about zero to five million in revenue, kind of all on self-serve. And so they were looking to take this jump into more of like a B2B sales type of a model. Um, and I jumped at the opportunity. It was, it was kind of the right timing and the right place for me to go earlier than I'd ever been before mm-hmm. and uh, wrap my hands around kind of the full 
the full uh, share of the B two B sales model um, at the business, and so I, I came on board and and recruited out a team of uh, ten reps, so five SDRs and five AEs. Uh, we built out an SMB and, and, a, and a mid market and enterprise sales team, um, and went to market with it. And it, it was an amazing journey. And we uh, we we got we went from about zero to a million in revenue on the B two B side, and about six, seven months. And it's, you know, it, it's funny because I look at the time at Zenefits and, and we did, you know, six times that or something like that in that same time period. Uh, right. But this was, this was harder and almost meant more um, just because the the market that we were competing in was very competitive and, and the um, going from sort of a self-serve model to a B2B model was more challenging than I could have imagined. But, um, but yeah. Okay. So I want to, I want to, I want to stay here for two specific topics. One of them is exactly what you just said. Going from a self-serve business to B two B or more towards like an enterprise a sales business, you, you choosing enterprise loosely for the way that I say that for de- defining it. But let, let, sure. let's talk about that. Um, talk about talk about the the learnings you had, and going from that from that self-serve business to a non-self-serve business as you were mm-hmm. building at Mixmax. Yeah. So the I think the first thing is that you have to understand that you know despite the fact that we. You were a pretty well established early stage SaaS business, humming it away at about five million in revenue. You have to look at this switch to a B two B motion as a completely new exercise in product market fit. Right. Um, and the reason being is that like the motion of um, convincing you know an entire org uh, or at least an entire team to buy you know an annual license of your product versus signing up for a much kind of lower risk per se at a slightly higher cost and doing it monthly. It's just a completely different motion. Um, and so I think one of the things that we, that we didn't do well early on was that we tried uh, a bunch of different plays. Um, and what I mean by that is that we, the product had broad applicability to from recruiting to account management to customer success and sales and SDR. Um, and we didn't necessarily like nail our niche until about a couple months in. When we started to figure out that like AE teams were like the right team, oftentimes they were using products that were more designed for SDRs, just by nature of inheritance and not having other options, and that these were the folks that were typically signing up on their own, and these are the ones we wanted to go after. And so I use this analogy sometimes when I think about um, scaling playbooks across different phases of growth. But um, if you if you look at like basketball, and I, I use a lot of basketball analogies, so you have to bear with me, but um, in the product market fit phase all you're really looking for is like a mismatch that you can exploit. And so if you've got sort of like one, let's say player on the court that's taller, faster, stronger, can jump higher, or has like one move that you can kind of repeatedly go to to get a bucket when you need it, um, that's what product market fit is. Um, it's not a whole range of plays. It, it's, it's sort of like one play. And so we figured out what that one play is and we went there and we started to scale it. And, um, you know, in the back of your mind, you're telling you're telling yourself, okay, I, I know that we're going to have to broaden this playbook a bit more. But part of this product market fit is is kind of repeatedly running that same play again and again and again. Hey, Robbie, can you give an example um, from a sales perspective? Yeah, sure. So um, uh, I think in the context of, of Mixmax, that was you know the way that our business worked is we would land in accounts through our self serve model. We would identify the ones where we had traction, and we'd sort of go outbound, so to speak, where we would yep. uh, reach out to the folks using the product and convert those into sort of larger paying accounts. Very similar, I'm sure, to kind of what you guys did with Sales Navigator at LinkedIn, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, good, good, good. That's a good yeah. example. All right, keep going. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and so basically what we'd look for there is, okay, like, uh, you know, we're, we're running a, a range of different plays. We're running plays against recruiting teams where we're seeing similar things, account management teams where we're seeing similar things. And, and um, we're seeing the win rates with AE teams just a little bit higher. Um, and we start to figure out why. And, and it's because, you know, there's a couple of things. One, the buyer, who in this case is like the VP of sales or the leader of the sales org, typically has budget and decision making power. And there isn't necessarily any like approval process beyond them. Right. Uh, and so if we can make like a business case and the AEs can kind of go to their boss and say, we need this tool to be successful, it's typically a fast sales cycle and the win, the win rates are better. Nice. And so we just looked at the data there um, and we understood, okay, this is a play that we can consistently run. And so we made a conscious effort to focus our efforts on that play. And we, we dug through our leads and we focused on that play and we honed our account lists and we focused on that play and, and we win with that play. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you kind of comb sort of the lowest hanging fruit and you have to go a level up. And, and, and once you've sort of done that a few times, it's time to start thinking about, okay, um, how can we make this repeatable where you can run an actual play um, that can give you a predictable win percentage. And that's when you start to go to scale and, and repeatability. Yep, cool. And walk us through, uh, while we're on it, walk us through uh, scale and repeatability. What are a few of the things that you're doing as a sales leader um, or a sales and marketing leader um, when you're trying to execute on and build scale and repeatability? 
Yeah, and I think this is this is a part of the business, um, just candidly, that I think uh, you know makes Max and a lot of other companies they're they're, they're making that transition right now right. Um, to scale and repeatability. It's it's a different you know it's a different timeline for every business. With, with Zenefits, it was a you know it was a short six month window. With Flexport, it was longer. With Mix Max, it was something in the middle. Um, but yep. basically, scale and repeatability is about like running an actual play. So for, rather than you're just thinking about like a mismatch where we just throw the ball to the tallest guy, he just turns around and dumps it in for two <laughs> points. Yep. You're at, you're actually you're actually running a play where you're involving like multiple different people um, with the play. And so what you can do here is you can control the the outcomes a little bit better. Um, and so let's say we want to like run like a you know a pin down for like a shooter to come out and shoot a three pointer, and now we're looking at three points instead of two. Similarly with scale and repeatability. Now what we can do is actually involve uh, multiple people within an organization, sell across multiple departments, and create bigger deal um, sizes, um, and in some cases, faster sales cycles. So whatever it is that you're specifically after, if you're a more transactional business, that might be just reducing friction and creating faster sales cycles. Mm -hmm. For more of a mid-market or enterprise sale, that might be about creating bigger deal values. But um, with scale and repeatability, you're at a place now where your sales cycle looks a lot more like a full-blown play that you can run with a predictable win percentage. So you know that if you run this play with the right type of account, 20, 25, 30% of the time, you're going to win. And then what that percentage looks like is, uh, you know, is going to be a certain deal value. You know? And what that allows you to do is build a business model around that and scale it. Um, and there's a lot of work that goes into that, but but sort of arriving from just exploiting a mismatch, mi um, pardon me, a mismatch to actually <laughs> running job. a play with a predictable <laughs> with a predictable win percentage, that's a big jump. And there's there's a lot of steps that it takes to get there. Uh, but really, the biggest difference is that uh, that predictability and what that win percentage is going to be when you run that play. Yep. Nice. Awesome. And then and then hyper growth. Um, let, let's walk through that because product market fit, scale and repeatability. You're moving on to hyper growth. What am I focused on there? Yeah. Yeah, um, and so kind of the the third phase and 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 in the journey um, is if you come back to this basketball analogy, now we've actually got a play that we can run with a predictable win percentage, right? This pin down screen for a three point shot. Um, in a hyper growth environment, typically now we are selling into uh, you know multiple different market segments. So maybe it's mid market and enterprise uh, and SMB, or maybe two of those. And typically we're selling across uh, multiple verticals and multiple geos, right? Yeah. So we're we're scaling this outfit. We've probably opened up offices outside of if we're based in the Bay Area, outside of the Bay area or or maybe a slightly lower cost market um and now we actually have a playbook um and it's like a range of situational plays that we can deploy with a predictable win percentage depending on what that situation entails and so to make this jump from running sort of this pin down three-point screen which is our, our scale and repeatability play we have to hire other highly competent sales leaders to help deploy this playbook both from experience they have in the past, but also what we're seeing in the market. So by the time you get to hyper growth, you need a team of people that can actually draw up these repeatable plays and coach and train your organization to run these plays. It can't all come from one person. It just can't. Right. One person can draw up can draw up this play that can get you a predictable win percentage and scale and repeatability. But the best leaders are going to deploy like a you know a team of lieutenants that are going to help them build out a full blown playbook and train their org out. And so when you're at hyper growth, now you've got a range of plays that you can deploy to pace based on the situation that are still going to give you that predictable win percentage. And it's basically just another stage of growth and scale that allows you to sort of nail whatever the inputs are and have a reasonably predictable outcome. Cool. Excellent. I've got a couple more questions, just probably two more and then we can round this out. But then, then you're moving, then you're moving on from mix max. Tell us, tell us after that, both, what you've been doing, what you're up to now, and then you know maybe I'll ask a couple questions to round it out. Yeah, for sure. So um, after leaving, I, I ended up um, deciding to leave Mixmax, um, having kind of gone through the journey and, and done sort of what needed to be done there in terms of like this initial product market fit phase. Um, I handed the the reins off to a, another sales leader who's now doing a really good job helping them kind of bridge that gap to the uh, kind of repeatability um, journey. And, uh, and they're doing a really good job at that. And I'm super excited to see kind of where it shakes out. Um, and actually since then I've, I've built my own consulting practice. Um, not necessarily because I intended to, but because I've had enough people that I just, I know and respect and, and I've worked with that have asked me for support and help where, yep. um, I'm actually now basically consulting, uh, on a, on a full-time basis. And so I have a, a couple different clients, um, that I work with. And, and basically what I do is I help folks, 
um, skip a lot of the potholes that you can step in in the early days and, and sort of get to scale and repeatability and set yourself up for hyper growth like faster. Um, and that ranges from uh, recruiting and building out sales and SDR teams to strategy to um, just improving operations to um, sales ops and enablement and sort of the whole spectrum of whatever business needs because I've been fortunate to have experience experience and a lot of those things. And, yep. um, and I typically just work with clients where I'm super interested in their business and it's sort of just like a really good fit. I've been fortunate to be able to work that way. Um, and that's, uh, that's what I'm doing today. Awesome, man. That's great. And you're excellent at it. When you're thinking about, uh, coaching teams, both yeah. coaching large teams as well as coaching individuals, um, are there any fundamental or very simple frameworks that you can offer, um, where you think, you know, this is how this is my coaching framework, or this is how I think about coaching and, and some of the steps that I go through to execute that. Yeah. Um, well, I think fundamentally, you need to look at coaching as different than management. Um, you know, management is a little bit more of like an operational exercise, but coaching is a lot more about um, empathy. And it's a lot more about uh, I use this word lightly and, and I, I'm reading a book right now, so I have to give credit where credit's due, due called trillion dollar coach. It's a book by Eric Schmidt and yep. some of the other like Google, Google executives about Bill Campbell is a it's former a book. Uh, college coach. It's a great book and, and um, talks a lot about creating an environment where uh, people feel love, you know, and, and feel like they're loved and feel like they're in a safe place to perform and to fail, uh, but also feel like challenged in a way that they've never been challenged before. And so I think that like when it comes to coaching, you're, you're tapping a little bit more into like empathy and people's like, you know, uh, will, um, more than you are necessarily the, the X's and O's and, and sort of like the numbers. Uh, it's a little bit more what I like to call like the why. Um, what, what's your why, right? Yep. And that's something that I always try to recruit for and, and sort of like uh, coach people on. Um, and if you can tap into what that one thing is, um, that is like a well of uh, energy and, uh, and power that can give people to perform at a level they, they never have before. And so when I think about coaching, I think about it as sort of almost like the opposite of management in a way. Um, and I think that the best leaders balance those two things. And it's hard to do. Yeah, ab absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Let's round it out with two rapid fire questions. Um, you've been really generous with your time. Thanks so much, Robbie. I really appreciate it, man. Um, first one um, is a personal and professional question. I ask this to people on their birthdays um, every single year. Um, but – I'm going to ask you, even though it's not your birthday, uh, what is the most valuable lesson you've learned professionally in the last 12 months? Ooh, the most valuable lesson that I've learned professionally in the last 12 months. Um, I don't, I don't know that I have a great answer, but I can think of, I guess a couple things that I have learned. Um, I think that at the end of the day, like working in consulting has been an interesting practice for me just because the uh, you're hired as, an, as a subject matter expert and expected to sort of like know the answers to things pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that like something that you can get caught up in, whether it's uh, in a full time role or in a consulting role, is answering questions to look like you know what you're talking about versus just admitting when you know that you when you don't know. Right. Um, and I think like I've been saying I don't know more than I ever have in my entire life. And I think one of the things uh, that you start to learn as you get older and learn, um, is that the more you, the more you learn, the less, you know, in a way, uh, or the more you start to understand how little, you know, right. um, exactly. and so I think for me, it's like in a professional context, I think it's like helping be really honest about what the knowns and unknowns are for any specific situation. And then just operating based on, uh, as much logic as you can from that point. Um, versus coming in with like assumptions or try to trying to like signal that you know more than you do. Um, just getting to a point where you're confident in yourself and you understand the things that you know and don't know and, and own it. Um, and then work on in the background, learning things and shoring up your knowledge set. Um, so I know that that's not like super specific, but I think like most people can probably really relate that there's a moment where you feel scared to admit that you don't know something, you end up admitting it and then everything is better as a result of it. Um, I think in general, it's better to operate with just the full transparency of what you know and don't know. Yep. Absolutely. Good one. Part B of that question. What's the most valuable lesson you've learned in the last 12 months personally? The most valuable lesson, but I, man, these are good questions. I wish you had told me ahead of time so I, I could prepare a, well, you're welcome. a sharp answer. I, I, can send Nicole, <laughs> I can send Nicole a quick email and she could send me an answer back for you if you want to. <laughs> okay, interesting. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think that the most valuable lesson that I've – and honestly, this comes back to me personally for um, what I talked about earlier about your network being your net worth. Um, I, I've, I've been fortunate enough to work for a lot of really, really great people and who have hired great people and put me in a position to then go hire great people. Mm -hmm. And I'm just kind of getting to an age now where I'm seeing the benefit of that, where 
Um, when I start to think about taking on a new client or, or looking at a new opportunity, I almost always start with my own network versus, um, you know, going and sort of exploring the, the market more broadly. Um, and I think that that's just like one of these compounding effects of uh, work that I've put in earlier and, and getting the chance to work with really amazing people at, at a number of different companies um, that we've talked about in depth. And, and I think that I guess just to reiterate a point I made earlier, like you can't really invest enough in picking uh, the people that you work with um, in a smart way. And that's not necessarily just the people that you spend time in the office with. Those are also the people that you spend time with out of the office. I mean, for you and I, Brandon, like we've we've been uh, we've been doing Skype calls and having conversations and, and just getting to know each other over the last three, four years. And yep. I consider you a very close friend as a result of that, but I've learned so much and, and you haven't worked for any of the companies that I've worked for. And so you can go out Good and point. you can find, Good point. you can find these people outside of there too. So I just encourage people to like throw yourself out there and like be vulnerable, but, but really the, the compounding effect of like the network you build happens later in life. And I'm like just starting to see it right now. And it's, uh, it's amazing. The fruits of the labor feel good. The last question is a fun one. Um, so what can we learn from the NBA playoff results this year? The outcome, Kawhi Leonard, KD and Clay injuries. What can we learn from the playoff results that translates to finding and retaining great talent? Ooh, um, yeah. So I, I we could, we could do a whole separate podcast about this because this should. is one of my favorite topics. This is my this um, is my pitch to you. This is, I'm just asking one question. And now we just start a new podcast. It's amazing. The neighbor the neighborhood is is got a lot of range um, for sure. Um, so I. My my takeaway from the playoffs is that the role of the general manager in the NBA is quickly becoming um, the one of the most important roles in the entire organization up there with like who are the, the one or two best players you have on your team. And I think that that was demonstrated by Masai Ujiri, who's the GM and president of basketball ops at uh, in Toronto. Um, during the midseason, he uh, coordinated a trade uh, for Kawhi Leonard and Danny Green um, for DeMar DeRozan, who was a longtime favorite of that team. Um, over the last five years, he's drafted like a whole host of really good players late in the rounds because they're, they're a good team and they're not in the lottery. So in the late 20s, they're, they're picking guys like Pascal Siakam and and a bunch of guys that were big, um, you know, big contributors in the playoffs. And just this last offseason, after they won the championship, the Washington Wizards offered him some insane contract, I think something like $10 million a year uh, for a GM position. Yeah, plus, yeah, plus equity. equity. And I think what we're starting to figure out is that um, the NBA is becoming more transactional in terms of the life cycle of players' time on teams. Uh, players are taking more control over their own careers. And the GMs that are thinking about this from like a money ball perspective, but also able to build relationship with guys and guys want to play for them and with them because they have their best interests at heart, are the guys that are winning. And so Bob Myers uh, of the Warriors has been that guy for the last five years. We're starting to see a whole new generation of, of these GMs come into the fold. And so I think what we're going to start to see is that this GM position in the NBA um, is sort of one of the most sought after and highly recruited roles, maybe even more than a head coach. Um, and I think Masai is a perfect example of that. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for listening. If you appreciated and enjoyed the episode, go ahead and make a comment on the post for the episode on LinkedIn. If you love the Neighborhood Podcast, we'd love for you to subscribe, rate, and give us a five-star review on iTunes. Until next time, go get it.